As I mentioned, we are celebrating Christmas. We are still in the octave of Christmas. It's only the second day of Christmas. So the focus is still very much on the birth of Christ for eight days after Christmas. And in fact, the Christmas season lasts until the baptism of our Lord, not the epiphany, but the baptism of our Lord. So that's the Christmas uh, season. And, you know, it's, it's strange that we have today the Feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr, the second day of the Christmas octave. Why would the church put this feast on this day? Couldn't they have put it on a different day? Well, surely they could have. But you see, it's a reminder to us that even though we have the joy of Christmas and the promise of all that Christ comes to accomplish by means of his birth, it's a reminder to us, as we heard in today's gospel reading, that if we are followers of our Lord, well, it's not just about presence. It's not just about the good things, but we will be persecuted. And so it's a reminder to us that if we choose to follow Jesus, we have to be willing to suffer for him, and we have to be even willing to lay down our lives for him if we should be called to do that. And of course, we have the example in St. Stephen. So he is the first Christian martyr. You know, when we celebrate the, um, the slaughter of the innocents, we refer to them as the proto-martyrs. They're, they're a kind of uh, martyr. They died for Christ, but but they, they, they were not true Christians, but, but um, they will receive the blessing of Christ because they, they died in the place of Christ. That's on the uh, 28th of December. In the case of St. Stephen, you know, it's interesting. He's working great wonders and signs among the people, as we heard in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. So, in other words, it's clear that the power of God is active and working within him and through him. And yet people don't want to listen to him. So certain individuals, these people who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen, notice how they, they debate with Stephen, they, they argue with St. Stephen, but they're not able to overcome his wits, um, they're not able to um, withstand the wisdom and, and the spirit with which he spoke. In other words, he was very logical. Everything he said was true. Everything he said was convincing. But they didn't want to accept it. And it mentions later that um, they, they blocked their ears. They covered their ears. But his enemies covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. They just didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the truth about Jesus and everything that Jesus came to accomplish. And it's, it's very significant because here's Stephen, he's filled with the Spirit, he's speaking with charity, he's quoting scripture to them, he's even working signs and wonders, but they block their ears. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. Why not? You see, we tend to be creatures of habit. We like things as we know them to be. We don't like change, and we don't want to change ourselves. And also, we don't want to acknowledge or admit that perhaps we may have been wrong. And so many people are not open to the truth. Even today, they're not open to change. So in the scriptures, we are told to test everything by means of the Spirit, which means we have to be open. We have to consider we have to acknowledge that we may be wrong. We have to be humble enough to acknowledge that we may be wrong. Otherwise, we are like these individuals who just stop their ears, who don't want to listen. I've referred to that book that I, I've read. Um, it's written by a couple of Protestants. I can't remember their name right now. But the, but, but the book is, uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And in this book, they quote prominent scientists, uh, very uh, prominent scientists, who acknowledge, based on their scientific uh, discoveries, their, their scientific understanding of the universe and things in the universe, and these scientists, based on their findings of the universe, they acknowledge that everything points to a creator, an intelligent designer of the universe, that it could not have come about by chance. So these scientists have publicly acknowledged and admitted that, yes, all the evidence points to this, but we don't want to acknowledge it. 
And one of these scientists ad uh, admitted that the reason they don't want to acknowledge it is because it would mean that they have to change their life. Because if there is a God, then there is morality. And if there is morality, that means I have to give up my sinful lifestyle. I have to give up pretending that I'm my own God and leave it, leading my life the way that I want. And I, it would mean I have to submit to God. And they don't want to do that even though they are scientists and the science points to the fact that there is a creator. It's very, very sad. It's very, very unfortunate. But you see, we all tend to be like that. We don't like change. We like to have a routine. We don't like things upset. And sometimes, you know, God is calling us to change, to become better persons to overcome certain in, in sinful inclinations or, you know, for certain people holding on to a grudge or anger. Let go. No. That would mean I have to humble myself. I can't do that. This is how we tend to be. All of us. And it's very, very unfortunate. So yes, we are called to change. And in many ways, we are called to be like St. Stephen. We are called to manifest the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the scriptures. We are called to do great signs, great wonders. Sure, we're not saints. Sure, we can't do miracles. But, you know, it mentions, you know, elsewhere that they, 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 they recognize the Christians because of the love they had for one another. They marveled at the Christians because of the tremendous love they had for one another. We don't manifest that often enough. We need to. So we need to change. So yes, Christ is born for us, but he's born within us also. And his kingdom, he wants to establish his kingdom within us, not just in the world around us, but first and foremost in us. And it's only when we possess the kingdom within our hearts that we can manifest the kingdom to those around us. So Christ needs to be born within us ever more fully. And part of that, as I mentioned, entails facing opposition facing persecution. In other words, a certain amount of suffering. Christ tells us, take up your cross and follow me. But he promises all kinds of rewards, heavenly riches, and, and even just the ability to, to make it to heaven. So we have his assurance. We have his promise. We have everything to live for and to die for even, as long as we have Christ within us.